Um, why did Jesus have to die mm -hmm. to save us? Yeah, this is a really interesting question. And it's interestingly enough, I'm thankful for whoever asked this because this is something I've been thinking about. In fact, I received this question uh, through our radio ministry two weeks ago. And I could talk for an hour. By the way, forgive me, some people my answers are too long because you just want me to get to the next question and other people they're too short. Okay, so, my next question yeah, is. Yeah, um, thank you. So can I just give myself, let me give it to you briefly. Jesus first asked the Father, by the way, I love country music. Don't you love country music? Garth Brooks, God's great, some of God's unanswered prayers. You know, you've heard that song. The best answered prayer in the Bible was when God said no to Jesus' request in the Garden of Gethsemane. Lord, is there any other way? Can this cup, Matthew 26, verse 39, and then again, I think in verse 42 or 44, Lord, can this cup pass from me? And that was a resounding silence, and the answer, no. The way to pay for our sin, God design. And here's what I want you to think about when you think about the necessity of the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. Jesus, there's us, we stand condemned because of our sin. The only thing you and I can contribute to our forgiveness is our sin. The only thing we can contribute is our inability to save ourselves. And then we have God who needs to deal with sin. And then if you're not careful, if you don't have right orthodoxy, you think that Jesus is just this kind of third innocent person over here. And this is where the importance of 2 Corinthians 5 comes in. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. God laid the sin of the world on himself, the second person of the Trinity, Jesus, paid for that sin in full, died, that sacrifice was acceptable. How do we know that? The physical bodily resurrection of Jesus. And so we see that the cross is this way that was, by the way, the scriptures say, ordained. The lamb was chosen before the creation of the world and the foreknowledge and omniscience of Almighty God. God didn't have to scurry around after the great catastrophe in Genesis chapter 3. There's a lot more I could say, but that's why Jesus had to die on the cross. It's great. Um, some people say that religion is a bad thing. You have said that religion is the single most powerful force in changing history and bringing transformation. Um, so then are all religions the same? Hmm. Great question. Again, thank you for asking. And by the way, I answer that in depth in my Bible study answers to tough questions. No, religions are not all the same. Um, and it's sometimes we apply illogical thought when we shouldn't. It's like saying, are all restaurants the same? Are all flavors of ice cream the same? All religions do not have the same claims, and all religions do not have the same aims. And this is where, again, in my opinion, Christianity is utterly unique. Um, what do we see? I mean, so what, I, think of, I think of Jesus and Peter, Lord, where will we go? You have the words of eternal life. Do you remember that conversation with Jesus? And to whom will we go, Lord? Remember, I think it's John 6, 66, will you leave too? Remember, in, in, the, in the concept of first century, the, 4Q285, the Dead Sea Scrolls, picture a coming Messiah. The Jews were accepting, expecting a Messiah that would kill Romans, vanquish a corrupt priesthood, uh, rid them of the oppressive Romans. Uh, and then what do we see? We see, we see that something utterly unexpected happened. Jesus says, I have to go to the cross and people leave him. Are you going to leave too? Where would we go? You have the words of eternal life. And he offers this hope in the face of adversity. So um, are all religions the same? Christianity is the only religion that provides atonement, deals with sin. What do we see in, I mean, are you going to become a Buddhist? I mean, in Buddhism, Nirvana is literally self-annihilation. In Islam, I have a book, I, I don't believe it's available tonight, called Jesus and the Jihadis, where I, I, I've read the Islamic trilogy, the Quran, the Sunnah, Sirah, Hadith. Um, it's interesting because Allah never really shows up in paradise. Um, there's really not a personal relationship with Allah in Islam, so that's not a similar religion. But yet, this is a question that's gained traction. Um, I, I had a trainer several years ago by the name of Farhad, and he was a nominal Muslim until he went to Hajj. 
and he returns from his pilgrimage to Mecca. By the way, there's a $10 billion reconstruction project. Think about that right now, $10 billion happening. 125,000 Muslims will be able to circumnavigate the Kaaba every hour when the $10 billion project is over. Um, he returned to our training session, and Audrey and I would always pray before our training session. We needed prayer. He was an Olympic athlete and trained us like we were Olympians. And all of a sudden, he comes over and joins us and says, hey, we're praying to the same God. And to my shame, I really didn't have a solid answer for him in that moment. And I thought, well, I need to not answer that better. And so when you look at the different claims and the different aims, we see something utterly unique about the Christian religion, the Christian belief system that we don't see in other religions, not only in modern times, but of antiquity and even before that. I, I often say that uh, when we believe that all religions are the same, it's a little bit like saying all roads lead to the same place. Mm. We know that's not true if you've ever taken a vacation. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, there's several questions here about secular religion. Hmm. Talk about secularism as a religion. Yeah. Well, friends, secularism, there's an evangelization that's happening to the world. Go read, and this is not a political statement, read William Barr's comments at Notre Dame last week. Um, I was just saying, hear, hear, and amen. The religion of secularization is, is not going to accept you not buying in. You either buy in or you get out of the way. Um, and it's a lot like other religions that have won um, not through converts, but through literally just annihilation of people or belief systems. And it is a religion, and it, its church is the modern university. I can speak about university professors as one. Many professors are great Christians, and many professors are nihilists. They believe in nothing, and that's what they teach. And they teach this doctrine of secular humanism that is alive and well today, and it's growing. Um, and it's, it's growing to such an extent that in my conversations with unbelievers who buy into secular human, humanism, they don't believe the church offers anything. And that's why I wanted to write this book. They don't see the need for Christians until there's a tragedy. Now, I was evacuated. I live in the most diverse county in America. You can look it up. Fort Bend County in, outside of Houston, Texas is the most diverse county in America. 180 languages are spoken in our county. During Hurricane Harvey, worst natural disaster in American history, I documented this after we were evacuated for nine days. Christians outpaced the U.S. government helping people in disaster. I lived through this. I saw it in Fort Bend County. Christians were like SWAT teams for God, knocking on people's doors, didn't matter what the color of your skin was, what neighborhood you lived in, saying, hey, I'm such and such from Presbyterian or Second Baptist or, or you know, Faith Church off 359. We're here to muck out your house. Now, we have families, many families, so there's uh, healthcare is a huge industry in Houston and obviously energy. We have much, many families from India. Do you know how many conversions there were when people would walk in and say, can we muck out your house that has sewage in it, it's flooded, but do you mind if we all have prayer together? Do you think anyone said, no, you can't pray? Literally here serving me. This gets back to my point about Jesus being the great benefactor of humanity. And you know what's fascinating, and I'm sorry that this will offend some who hear this. I did not see a singular, single atheist tent handing out bottled water in the wake of Hurricane Harvey. I didn't see one. I'm, they may have been there. What I saw were Christians going literally first man in and last man out, giving their time, their money, their resources, so many conversions to Christianity for meeting people in the point of need. And this is the great legacy of our faith. Uh, it's Amy Carmichael speaking about unanswered prayer. I don't know if we have any questions about unanswered prayer. Do you remember she woke up every day? She wanted those Irish blue eyes. And she asked the Lord to change her eye color to blue from brown until the Lord called her to India where she ministered for 56 years without a furlough. And she used to take coffee grinds and she would rub them on her face and with those deep brown eyes, she would cover up and she would go rescue over a thousand girls from Hinduism and sexual prostitution. And she realized, oh Lord, that's why. That's why you didn't answer my prayers. You wanted me to have brown eyes for the calling you gave me. She rescued over a thousand girls. Queen Victoria contributed 
uh, to her cause. It's, it's fantastic. And so I got to the point, Dr. Strait, where my editor at Baker said, stop sending us examples how Christianity is changing the world. This will be a, we have to keep this book digestible. Um, that's where I say it's unimpeachable, and that's where I believe Christianity is a force for good in the world, to where even if you weren't a Christian, you wouldn't not want Christians hanging around. Um, uh, this question says, how does one respond to the claim that Jesus was a socialist or a communist? Hmm. Yeah, no, this is a good question. People read the book of Acts. There's been books written about this that try to buy in. Um, and I, you just can't read it that way. That's a modern eisegesis, reading that back into Scripture. That's uh, doing what happens, um, unfortunately, in many churches and Bible studies. They go into, it's not hard to be a heretic. Can I just remind you this? <laughs> I, I'm, I am a, I'm an exegete, like that's what I do. I exegete the Scriptures. I don't allow theological systems to define me. I let the Bible speak for itself. Having said that, when I read the Bible with no context or Jesus with no context, I become a heretic. And we can read all kinds of things into the Scripture. We can weaponize the Bible. And unfortunately, it happens too often. And so that's why we need to read things in context. Tom Wright says you, we need to always read the New Testament with first century eyes. Communism didn't exist in the first century. Last time I checked. Um, and so we need to read it with first century eyes. But again, you can make the Bible, you can force feed the Bible to fit any belief system if you have an uncritical, unthinking audience, gullible audience. And that's why we need to be careful Christian thinkers. So, and I, I think that it strikes me that Jesus wasn't a capitalist either, mm. that Jesus wasn't a materialist. Yeah. Jesus was a, a, a personist. He was, a, he was somebody who, who loved people, and, and money was a tool to him mm -hmm. that was neutral until you loved it, hmm. and then it wasn't neutral anymore. And uh, so, so my, my thought is that, that maybe when you, when you read some of the things about Jesus not wanting the love of money to become the core, you can say, well, see, he wants us to share with everybody. He wants to, he wants to, to make a a communist system, mm. and, and that's not true at any of it. There are a lot of rich people yeah. throughout the pages of Scripture that God blessed. Mm -hmm. And used. I mean, you think of Lydia, mm -hmm. the seller of purple and Thyatira. Mm -hmm. I, I mentioned, I started to mention Luke 8, 1 through 3 earlier, women provided for the financial needs of Jesus' ministry. Jesus didn't FedEx money down from God the Father to provide for his ministry. Women provided. Luke is doing something there. Wait, wait, there was that, there was that coin in that fish's mouth, so that's kind of UPS, isn't yeah, that's it? that's right, yeah, that's DHL. And um. <laughs> what's also fascinating, those are the same women by name who are the autoptes, according to Luke, the eyewitnesses of the resurrection. It's kind of interesting. It's interesting that uh, there's a revival taking place in many Muslim countries right now, and, and the characteristics that I've read about are that it's, that it's primarily women-led, mm. And that second of all, much of it is happening through dreams. Yes. That Jesus is appearing to them in dreams, and, and that is the conversion experience that starts it. So, And that's documented, friends. And that, that, uh, you ought to look into that if you want to read more. The Holy Spirit is speaking to people in dreams. Jesus is revealing himself. And more Muslims, by the way, I'm all about Muslim evangelism. More Muslims have come to faith in Christ in the last decade than the previous 14 centuries combined. So we need to pray. I will mention this footnote since Dr. Strait brought it up. I did a, a meeting, recent, well, I say recently, in 2004 with um, Peace Child, the book, uh, who is the missionary who wrote Peace Child? It's such a, Don Richardson. Mm -hmm. uh, what a book, by the way. For those of you who want to know what about people that have never believed and where the name Jesus has never been heard, go read Peace Child. He got to the end of our event, and this is 2004, so shortly after 9-11, and he said the greatest threat to Christianity is the growth of Islam, mainly biological growth. And he said, as Christians, we need to be conversant how to reach Muslims for Christ. I've never forgotten that. Uh, he just went to be with the Lord not long ago. But I recommend Peace Child to your Christian library. Great. Uh, another question. Um, you say that atheism is dangerous. Why? Yes. 
the facts of history bear that out. I'm not saying that every atheist is dangerous. I'm saying atheism's logical end is what we see that's carried out, by the way, in the full scope of democr the democracy of the 20th century, when you think about it. Um, Hit Hitler would not have been possible without democracy. That's interesting to think about. Um, when we see the body counts, when we see the legacy of atheism, um, not just in the body counts, but in the spiritual bankruptcy, that's where we see it becoming dangerous. And then, again, I'm, I'm up here talking for a few brief moments. I would encourage you to read part two of Unimaginable because what we're seeing now, Dr. Strait, is revival happening in so many of these formerly atheistic countries, countries that moved away from God, embraced atheism and its logical worldview to its fullest extent, now saying we need Christianity, we need revival. We need Bibles, we need the scripture. By the way, um, I went to Cuba before it was cool to go to Cuba, I might add. Um, flew Eastern Airlines, you remember that airline from many <laughs> years ago? They were putting us around for, you know, moving us around for weight issues on the plane. Uh, I'm now a Bible smuggler, I have this on my CV. I called my friends at Lifeway and I said, would you give me some Spanish Bibles uh, to take to, Sa we went to Santiago to do a Bible exhibition. Uh, with the Museum of the Bible as part of a team of leaders that went. It was amazing. To see the hunger for the scriptures in Santiago, Cuba, the entire city of Cuba came out, beautiful night under the stars, thousands. They performed the Bible, Cuban dancers and singers did, Genesis to Revelation, took three hours. Then we opened the cathedral, the only church in that region. Have you ever been to a community where there are no churches anywhere? Cuba's like that. Um, and people were looking at the Spanish Bibles and the artifacts, but they were looking at the pictures. There were illustrations of the story of the Bible, and people were more interested in those illustrations than these priceless artifacts of Spanish Bibles. Well, anyways, to make a long story short, my wife saw that it said La Biblia, the Bible in this case. She's like, don't you think we should put that in a suitcase, Jeremiah? I was like, oh, well, that, that's a great idea. So we put it in a suitcase. When we landed in Santiago, they started searching people's bags. Go, like we went through security coming into the country, which was odd for me. Um, but guess whose North Face bag they didn't search? Right here. Um, and we've now sent something like 6,000 Bibles through our channels to Santiago. So our, our minimal effort the Lord's using, and I keep getting photographs of primarily younger Cuban Christians who are getting a copy of the Bible, and it looks like Christ Christmas morning, huge smile on their face. So I'm sure many of you have had similar experiences in other atheistic countries. And what was fascinating to me in Santiago, you go outside of the hotel, and you're asked for, I'm going to be braided you, you're asked to engage in all kinds of activities, and if you want drugs, within a few paces of the only hotel in Santiago, Cuba. So again, when we see what I mentioned tonight, humanity at its finest, it's the places where the gospel goes and reigns. And I think we're really myopic. I think that we see the world based on our neighborhoods and our, mm -hmm. our so politics true. and our televisions. And the reality is there's revival breaking out all mm. over the world. It just isn't happening Absolutely. near as much as we'd like it in America. Uh, this is a really point blank question. Why does God need to be worshiped or accepted by humans? Hmm. Well, God created us to fellowship with him. He doesn't need to be worshiped. What was God doing before eternity? We can ask him someday. We can ask Augustine as well. Um, he doesn't need anything from us, but he did create us to have fellowship with him. And I think there's a real, I think that nuance is different. I think this is an important question. Um, but the chief end, end of man is to what? To glorify God, to love him, to have fellowship with him. And that is life to its fullest extent. We know that from John 10, verse 10, that God came to give you an abundant life, purpose, ultimate meaning, um, a, a, a reason to live. And that reason comes through knowing him. Mm -hmm. I love it. Um, kind of from a different direction. Uh, Dr. Johnson is an Oxford scholar. Can you speak about the influence C.S. Lewis has hmm. had on your thinking? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, so I've been to the kilns, as many of you have, where Jack Lewis lived, and uh, it was just amazing. I mean, who hasn't been influenced uh, in their thinking through C.S. Lewis, through Tolkien? Um, I'm fascinated by his conversion. I'm fascinated by what led up to it. I'm fascinated by the way in which he was unapologetic about his Christian faith, and even 
even looked down upon for his lowbrow popular writing. You've got to watch these scholars, okay? We write for dozens, okay? Um, and when you see C.S. Lewis… <laughs> That's too like, many. Yeah, exactly. Um, there's so much I can mention. Um, I think what I have personally benefited from visiting the kilns, C.S. Lewis did not become productive in his life until he gains stability in his life. And that really ministered to me at one time in my life about the need. Even though God had called me to ministry, I never wanted to get ahead of God. And when you study the life of C.S. Lewis, he, becomes, he doesn't become productive until his life gets a sort of balance and stability to it. Um, and so if you're asking me what ministered to me the most, having lived there, I felt like my life was out of whack <laughs> when I was living in Oxford. I didn't know anyone. I would often come back from faculty of theology at Keeble College, and I would ask my wife, I would just say, honey, I don't know if I can do this. It was my perception, I don't know if it was true, that I may have been one of the few Christians who actually believed the Bible. It didn't stop at the neckline. This was my cohort. It's different for every other cohort. But in mine, there was a bunch of secularists reading their Greek New Testaments and just doing deconstruction and pejorative discussions. It was good for what I do now. Um, I didn't realize that at the time, what God had planned. Um, but so it was relying on these, not only the writings of C.S. Lewis, but the story of his life, gaining stability, and then becoming effective for the Lord was a great encouragement to me. That's a great question. Great. Um, if slavery is morally wrong, why does God not specifically condemn it in the Bible? Well, I believe that God does condemn slavery in the Bible. We see that this is, and I talk about this in Unimaginable, what our world would be like with, without Christianity. Paul writes about Onesimus, greet him not as a slave but a brother, and whatever he owes you, uh, credit to my account. Um, and again, we can weaponize the Bible, we can misinterpret it to try to endorse slavery. And again, this is, this is a modern concept, friends. The world in which the New Testament and Christianity rose was not just a slave economy, it was a slave machine. What city did Paul spend more time ministering in than any other? Do you remember? You may have been there if you've been on a Mediterranean cruise, Ephesus. Do you remember what was in Ephesus? For 250 years, Ephesus was the slave, capital, slave market capital of the world. 40% of the empire were slaves during the time of Christianity. Uh, you know, if you wanted to make money, you, you took in slaves. I mean, this is what Caesar did in his Gallic Wars. After seven years, do you know how many he had a million slaves. Why? He had to pay for his wars. He had to become rich so he could become Caesar. Um, and this is the world in which Christianity grows up in, and this is this message of freedom. And so I would respond and say, have you read or studied Galatians 3.28? Paul writes, there is therefore neither Jew nor Gentile, male nor female, there is neither slave nor free. We are all one in Jesus Christ. Those words were seditious in a slave machine that was the Roman Empire. For someone to say we're one in Christ, there's neither slave nor free, we treat him as a brother. So when we see the, in, in fact, uh, I'm not the only one who thinks this, Alvin Schmidt, a sociologist who wrote um, a book about the greatness of Christianity discusses this at length as well as others, so I would encourage you to study that. Um, unfortunately, it's a stain on our faith that in certain contexts the Bible has been weaponized, misinterpreted, used heretically to endorse slavery, and that's why we need to be careful, critical Christian thinkers to stand against that. Part of the problem is that we, we can find in Scripture little bits and pieces to say anything we want to. So yeah. you have to be a student of the Scriptures. And there's difference between descriptive, and, your, you know, prescriptive narrative and descriptive. So uh, when we might, you know, this is what I love about the Bible, though. I mean, if we had time to get into why I love the Bible, it doesn't, it doesn't hold back embarrassing narrative. I mean, you would not choose Abraham to be a leader in this church when you read the book of Genesis. You wouldn't let him teach a Sunday school class. Um, <laughs> And when you see, uh, there's a you lot of You don't know my story. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's fascinating. Um, one of the popular uh, theories, I think, uh, today is that, that, that maybe there's a heaven and maybe there's a hell out there, but eventually everybody will go to heaven. Talk about universalism. Yeah. Well, hey, it sounds great, doesn't it? 
Um, you know, live your life however you want. You're all going to end up in heaven no matter what. Annihilation is another interesting theory that's gained a lot of traction, especially recently. Um, and that just is not what the scriptures teach. We have to make sure that we ground our faith in what the Bible says. We have a rational, text-based belief system. It's called the Bible. It's a great library of books. We have to read it in its own context, its own genre. But the scripture is very clear about eternity. And it's not hard to become a Christian. It's not hard um, to follow Jesus once you understand the facts the great historical fact, which is the greatest fact of antiquity, Jesus' death by Roman crucifixion, his physical bodily resurrection from the dead, the greatest single fact from history is the resurrection. And through that, you can have relationship in, in the presence of God with Christ eternally. Um, but we have to come to God on his terms, not on ours. And so we have to be careful about these lies that cultural spends. You know, we're all this, this gets back to all religions are the same. And I'm sorry. I'm just not going to check my brain at the door in my own faith. All religions aren't the same. We're not all going to end up in some utopia. Um, I am not God. I am not the captain of my ship. I am coming as a servant of Jesus Christ, a follower of Jesus Christ on his terms. And I love it. That's the thing. I love it. Um, and it's a joy, not a burden to do so. Okay. I have uh, two more questions. This one's okay. really hard because it asked you to be prophetic. Oh my, I'm, I'm not good at that. Do you foresee an end to the degeneration of Christianity in the West and in the U.S.? It's a, well, I'm not a prophet, nor am I a son of a prophet, um, but I will say this, Christianity thrived in the Roman Empire in a time of great apostasy, a time of, a time of great disbelief, um, even when many were turning away. And so, like I said in my message, I'm optimistic that you know, what's happening right now is a pruning of the vine and our faith, especially in the West. You're going to have to be a Christian or you're not. I believe we're coming to a point where there's not going to be any more middle ground. So are you in or are you out? Don't be in the middle. Um, that's what I believe we're getting to, and that's not all bad. I'd rather have committed Christians than the nominal ones. No, nothing bad, you know what I mean? Like the people who really want to be here, really want to press into Jesus, and I think great things can come from that. And I say that just because of what the history of the church is, that when we've been pressed, when we've been persecuted, there's, it's been the seeds of growth in many ways. And so I'm optimistic about it. Um, I'm also optimistic because I do see a growing trend of Christians who are tired of not being able to answer even the most pedestrian questions of, that they have in their own faith. I'm seeing a new desire. And I, I've, I have about 10 years of experience doing this a little more, specifically what we're doing tonight. And I'm seeing a greater yearning and hunger to love God with my heart, soul, and mind, um, and, and, to, and I'm seeing a growing trend like this wonderful church of, uh, you know, so many churches before were don't ask questions, just believe, you know, don't ask. But the beauty is when we invite people into a conversation, people respond so much better to questions than assertions, and so I think it actually invites people I don't need to have a revival, but to see, I mean, honestly, the faith grow in our own lives in new and interesting ways. I agree. Okay, uh, lastly, we've seen a whole generation uh, move away from traditional faith yes. for a whole bunch of reasons. The growth of what they call the nuns, I yep. don't have a faith. If, if this room was filled with college students, mm -hmm. what would be one thing that you'd want to say to them? Yeah. Or what would be one thing that we could say to our college students? Would Absolutely. be another way of shaping that. Well, first, let me again thank you, Dr. Strait and the whole team here. This night has been amazing. I don't want it to end. Thank you all so much for being such amazing hosts. This has been a, a delight. Um, if this room were full of university students, I would focus on the person of Jesus Christ and everything I said. Jesus Christ is uncomparable. His, his lasting legacy on change and transformation. That's, what I, that's why I end the book Unimaginable on Jesus and the transformation that he brings. Like the story of the Wagners that I shared at the beginning of the message, I would discuss the difference that he's made in my own life. It's amazing when we stop buying into the lies of culture and we start believing in absolute truth, how our life becomes less complicated. Have you noticed that? It uh, doesn't mean we're free from adversity, uh, not by any stretch, 
But I would also talk about the joy it is to stand in front of a congregation like this and say, I know I'm at the center of God's will for my life and the power and the strength, the vitality that brings. And so I would challenge them, what have you done with Jesus Christ? Don't, do you realize I have to appeal to Roman emperors for the same evidence that we have for Jesus of Nazareth? That's unbelievable, friends. It's, ama it's unimaginable. It's amazing. Secondly, I would talk about the, the great joy that comes when you know you're at the center of God's will for your life. Not living for yourself, living for someone and something greater. Great. Would you guys say thank you? <laughs> thank you all so much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, doctor. Appreciate you.